Good morning, North Lakes. It's good to be back with you again here online. And for those of you who uh, weren't able to join us at the center on Sunday, uh, we have started a new series at the beginning of the year. We had an amazing summer in the sun with several different guest speakers. And then we uh, are hitting Core 52. Uh, this year we're hitting the basic, the core beliefs of Christianity, uh, following kind of a general uh, direction of the chapters of this book by Mark Moore. And you can get a copy if you want to from uh, Amazon.com or uh, your local Bible bookstore. But uh, today, my question is, what is a half-truth? And why do they work so well? Example, <clears throat> a guy is pulled over by the police or the RBT. And the driver says, I only had a couple of beers. That is a half-truth. Because the truth is, they had several shots of whiskey, too. And the beers that he did have were 40s. So, half-truth. Example. A parent asks where their daughter has been. The teen tells her parents, Oh, I was over at Lisa's house. That is a half-truth. The truth is, she was at Lisa's house for about five minutes. And then friends came over, picked them up, and they went to a party, and bad things happened there. Example. A person fills out the tax form for the year and they put down on the line for wages uh, the same amount that the employer turned in to the government and that would be a half truth because the truth is that he had a side business where he provided services for cash payments and he never reported that income to the government example a lady encounters a salesman that promises a product that will provide knowledge and make her like a god with no consequences. That is a half-truth. The truth is that she would have lifelong consequences. She would lose her perfect home. She would have increased pain in childbirth. She would experience the death of a child and a life of hard work and pain separated from God. Half-truths. Why do they work so well? Because, at first glance, they seem legit, and they appear to have something that we want, and so we are willing to overlook <clears throat> the fine print, so to speak, to get the promised benefits. Uh, that's why they say the devil is in the details. Well, Satan <clears throat> uses the same old tricks today that he used on Adam and Eve in the garden. He makes promises and tells half-truths without telling us how much it's going to cost us. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. It says, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he also ate it. To really understand <clears throat> what happened, we have to realize that this isn't just a mistake or a careless oversight resulting in a mild warning no, they had a clear, very strict warning that they would die if they did this from God. And sin is a blatant rebellion, divorce from God in essence. Adam and Eve chose to have union with death and they have felt and we have felt those consequences ever since. And Jesus' best friend, John, sums up the temptation this way in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. Do not love the world or anything in the world 
Because if anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. So when we look at Jesus' own encounter with Satan, his temptation in the wilderness, we see that Satan uses the same tactics as he did in the garden. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now especially take note of the third temptation, Matthew chapter 4. Let's look at verse 8 and 9. It says, Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Satan offers Jesus a kingdom. Now Shane Wood, in a recent vlog, pointed out that Jesus had just announced that the kingdom of God was near and Jesus' kingdom was going to be established on the foundation and the, the core uh, element of his sacrificial atoning death on the cross to cover our sins. So Satan offered him, offered him a kingdom without a cross, a shortcut. And isn't that how temptation presents itself so often? A shortcut? An easy way out? Something that we want? Something that feels good? Maybe something forbidden? Something that makes life easy? But you probably will have to hide it or compromise to get it? As a kid, I remember... I stole candy from a store, and in the car, my mom looked in the rear view, saw chocolate on my face. So she turned the car around, went back to the store, and made me apologize and pay for it. I wanted candy, but I didn't want to pay for it. Shortcut. So another time... I remember I was mowing a yard for a lady and I was in a hurry. I wanted to get to the pool and have fun swimming with my friends, but I had this job and so I had to do the job first. So I literally jogged. I ran with the lawnmower pushing it and as a result, I missed several spots and it was, it was not a good looking job. And the lady said I had to do the whole thing over again before she would pay me. Haste makes waste. And so I missed out on even more pool time. Um, a shortcut. I tried to take a shortcut. I also remember the first time that a friend showed me pornography. I couldn't believe my eyes. Beautiful women. Posed to please, seductively looking at me out of the pages of that magazine. It was a shortcut. No time or effort required building a relationship or trust or friendship. There was no communication, no intimacy, just instant pleasure. Eye candy. But it was empty. It wasn't real. And it left me feeling ashamed and dirty. Do you see the pattern of the shortcut? Satan threw his shortcuts at Jesus, and this is how Jesus responded. Get away from me, Satan. Then later, as the cross drew near, and Jesus uh, had just been uh, affirmed by Peter that, yes, he was correctly identified as the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Jesus tells his disciples about his coming suffering and how he was going to die. And three days later, he would be raised to life. And Peter rebukes Jesus, pulls him aside and tells him, no, 
you are not going to suffer and die, Jesus. <laughs> and uh, Jesus uses the same phrase with Peter as he did with Satan. Get behind me. Get away from me, Satan. It's the same temptation to have the kingdom without a cross. And Jesus even stated in Luke 9, 23, very clearly, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. You see, the temptation is an attack on Jesus' identity. Jesus is the Lamb of God whose identity is centered on his sacrificial atonement for our sins on the cross. If he skips that step, he becomes someone else. He would no longer be the suffering servant. He would no longer be the Lamb of God who has come to save the world. He would no longer be Messiah or Savior. In the same way, Satan, when he tempts us, when he deceives us, he is attacking our true identity. And then when we sin and we rebel, we are choosing not to be identifying with the identity of being the, the child of God, not to be the light of the world, to, to choose not to be in relationship with the Father. And instead, we're uniting with something that brings death. We need to be aware of Satan's simple strategy. It's nothing new. Paul even wrote that there is no temptation except what is common to all mankind. Satan uses the same things for all people. Mark Moore, in his book, Core 52, uh, he breaks it down this way. He says, the core of all temptation is pride. Hmm. So Mark writes, pride isn't merely a sin, it's the sin. It's the genesis of every murder, theft, lie, adultery, and addiction. Every time it's at the root of why we prioritize our will over everyone else's good, even God's. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Maybe that's what happened there in the Garden of Eden in the mind of Adam and Eve was they wanted what they wanted and they weren't considering the consequences for others, for those that would come after them, for even God himself who was hurt by their sin, betrayed by their disobedience. Matthew 23 says, For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. James 4 says, But God gives more grace. That is why Scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. And Peter echoes that in chapter 5, verse 5, in his first letter. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows grace to the humble. Mark Moore breaks down the sin of pride this way. We have the pride of passion, the pride of possession, and the pride of position. And this just really mirrors uh, John's description because the pride of passion is the lust of the uh, flesh. And we would usually think of things that were sexual sins, uh, but this would also include sins of gluttony or drug and alcohol abuse and addictions. And then the second, the pride of possession is the lust of the eyes. And that would be things like jealousy and theft and materialism and even comfort, uh, doing things motivated by wanting to have a comfortable lifestyle. And then the third, the, the pride of position is the pride of life. 
That would be like manipulation and motivation to get popularity and status and the praise of men and power and uh, titles and trophies and accomplishments uh, for to make yourself exalted. So anytime that we find ourselves using what God has given us to only please ourselves or to exalt ourselves, we are in the middle of the devil's half-truth trap. Let me say that again. Anytime that we find ourselves using what God has given us, whether it's stuff or ability or possession or whatever, relationships, if we use those to only please ourselves and to exalt ourselves, then we're in the middle of the devil's half-truth trap. James puts it this way. Each person when is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. And then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. James chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. That is why Jesus and Scripture in general consistently calls us to die to self to take up our cross and follow him, to be crucified with Christ. Self-improvement, self-respect, self-esteem will not rescue you from the grip of sin. Only self-denial and spiritual humility, submitting to God's transforming power of love and grace can set you free through the gift of the Holy Spirit. I heard this quote uh, several years ago. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Let me say that again. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Ironically, that is a quote attributed to the late Ravi Zacharias, who, although he was an amazing apologist for the Christian faith, he proved that maxim is true. His sexual misconduct that came to light may not only cost his family and ministry millions of dollars, but it could cost some their very souls because of the disillusionment and the betrayal by someone that they trusted and respected as a Christian leader. Sin destroys lives. Yours, mine, everyone we meet, we have to take sin seriously. Now, I'm thankful for God's grace. I mean, we have no hope without Christ. Jesus died for our sins on the cross, and, and I praise God for that. We all praise God for that. But we can't use grace as an excuse to live carelessly or selfishly because we might be saved by grace, but our sins might cost someone their soul. It might cause them to reject Christ because of our behavior. So here's today's homework. Memorize Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, about the, the original temptation there in the Garden of Eden. And then I want you to ask this question. God, help me to see the half-truths that are tempting me to take shortcuts. God, will you help me to see the half-truths that are tempting me to take shortcuts? If you'll pray that prayer and you'll focus on the truth, God will reveal some shortcuts that we need to take seriously. So this week, let's determine to humble ourselves, to take up our cross, 
following Jesus, loving and serving others, not just trying to please ourselves, but looking of what is best for others and how to love God by doing that. Because you have to remember, like last week we emphasized, you have to remember your identity, your true identity. You are God's masterpiece, his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We are created to bring glory and praise and honor to God. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for loving us. And even when we have some really shameful moments where we have blown it, we have been so prideful, so selfish, and hurt ourselves, hurt others, we've hurt you. God, we ask that you would forgive us. God, that you would cover us with the grace that comes from uh, what your son uh, did on the cross to cover and to pay our debt. Uh, Lord, I also just ask that you would help us to be honest about some of the shortcuts we're willing to take just every week, day-to-day -day life, um, things that we let ourselves get away with, God, that are actually hurting us, that are destroying our lives, that are hurting others, hurting our witness uh, for you, Christ. Uh, Lord, I just ask this week, help us to have eyes to see and uh, that we will be able to listen to your spirit and that, Lord, you would uh, help us to uh, just this week not listen to the half-truths, not buy into the lie that Satan's throwing our way, but, God, uh, to resist him, to draw near to you. In Jesus' name we ask all these things. Amen. God bless you guys.